um, I will present here my results on uh, habitat management to foster natural and enemy colonization in tomato greenhouses. And this is a project that uh, we did together with researchers at the University of Lleida and the uh, IRTA, uh, the entomology lab of IRTA in Cabrils, that's in, Catalo uh, in Catalonia. Uh, this work has been recently published in um, in Journal of Test Science, and it was part of a project of Horizon 2020 named Euclid uh, that uh, dealt with uh, the application of integrated test managing, management in Europe and China collaboration. And in this project, we worked together, as I mentioned, with the researchers from Irta Cabrils and the University of Lleida, but there was two other persons, Marti Figueras, that did his uh, master thesis in this project uh, uh, with us that came from the University Autonomous of Barcelona and Montse Matas uh, that she's a um, plant protection advisor on the, um, on the region. So first of all I want to introduce a bit uh, which are the plant protection strategies in tomato greenhouses in the area and I think it's quite transversal through all the Mediterranean region also in France and I would say Italy, maybe even Tunisia. And I would say um, like in the 70s, like the horticultural uh, production was really in intensive in the area be uh, based mainly on chemical treatments when pest uh, populations were really, really high. Um, but it was the, in the late 80s, 80s and late 80s, there were problems of pests that were not able to they were not able to control with uh, chemical treatments and then uh, started the biological control in, in this sector. It started with inundative biological control with parasitoids to control uh, the tomato whitefly. And this uh, uh, um, did an evolution during the years with new pests arriving until uh, the 90s when some pests, like for example, Vimicia tabasi, was no longer uh, controlled with only parasitoids and uh, the research was focused on polyphagous mirid predators. Uh, they are polyphagous because they prey on multiple pests and they also uh, eat the plant, which at the moment was controversial. Um, and then it was in the 2000s, that the, the focus uh, was in conservation biological control. It kind of started when it was published that there was a continuous movement of these polyphagous made predators in and out of the greenhouses. So the greenhouse was no longer a closed system, but was a system that was interacting with the, at the farm scale and the landscape scale. Also, there was a stronger discussion that these predators were efficient biocontrol agents, even if they fed a bit on the plant and the interactions with, with this predator and other natural enemies were not as deleterious as one thought. Also, they appeared the first studies, well, first or consolidated studies on insectary plants and ecological infrastructures in tomato crops and mainly in Greece, Italy, France and Spain. So at the moment, uh, there's three main predators that um, are either introduced or conserved in bi biological control in tomato greenhouses. These are Macrolophus pinguaeus, a uh, couple of the seafood species, and uh, Residuocoris tenuis. In this kind of uh, of agriculture in annual crops and ephemeral crops, it's really important the time of colonization by, by these predators to be able to control um, the growing the growing pest. Uh, in order to maintain the pest levels low and, and to avoid, if possible, any um, treatments like pesticides. Um, it, there's tons of literature um, showing that the timing of colonization is is vital for biological control and I can provide literature on that if we want to discuss it further. And what's also really key is the provision of alternative resources, the availability of alternative resources for these predators at, 
at several scales. And what I would say, even more important on top of that, is the continuity of those resources in space and time. So in here, I show a graph by Shellhorn that shows the amount of resources, and then it shows the, uh, the different seasons, the year. And uh, you can see that in different scenarios, like here, there's a continuity scenario of the resource at the landscape level, or if there's bottlenecks or introductions or interruptions, you can see in the right hand side, what's the effects on the population level of whatever insect, pest, or uh, predator at, at the landscape scale. So in general, we would say for predators and natural enemies, we want to foster continuity in the, um, in the resources to be able to, to keep their population stable. So when it's the time to colonize a new crop, um, they are ready to do that. So in, in the area, there's been a lot of discussion about there's some greenhouses presenting early colonization versus other greenhouses presenting late colonization. The farmers talk about that, the protection advisors talk about that, but we really don't know at the moment what causes that the greenhouse has early colonization and thus probably is ready to uh, their populations to control pests whether other greenhouses mm, missing out and probably having to, to apply chemical treatments. And uh, there's quite a lot of uh, literature on management of greenhouses and what can foster or damage, especially like uh, natural enemy populations in the greenhouses. There's a bit less uh, literature on how to manage these populations at the farm scale with uh, alternative host plants but there's still quite a lot of information, but there's not much on which are the landscape scale eff effects for these um, predator species. To my knowledge, there's only one study up to date that's by Ab Abiron and collaborators that they um, studied uh, colonization of uh, Macrolophus pygmaeus in, in France. And it's the only study that we had as a reference of which could be uh, the effects of landscape on these natural enemies. Of course, there's tons of literature on landscape scale effects on, on other uh, enemies. And we know that probably semi-natural habitats or natural habitats play, play a role. Our interest here would be like to study the interactive effects of all these scales. So um, one way to foster resource continuity during the season is the establishment of bunker plants in greenhouses. In this case, it's the establishment of Calendula officinalis as a bunker plant. So this plant is kept all year long in the greenhouse and thus can maintain the populations of these predators that are of interest in the greenhouse. Mm. However, we have a small issue that I didn't mention till now that some of these predators do indeed inflict damage to plants. And especially it's the case of Nesidiochoris tenuis, and which here you can see a picture can really damage the buds and, and really um, decrease the, um, the yield of tomato plants. So of course there has to be a balance about fostering these populations, but depend which predators and on, in which resources. Uh, so the hypothesis of this work were that um, mirit uh, predator colonization precocity is stable through time for each of the studied greenhouses. So we wanted to see whether they showed consistently early versus late colonization. The second hypothesis was that greenhouse habitat management practices using calendula bunker plants inside the greenhouse or by maintaining diverse host plants at the farm scale favored this early colonization. And the last was that a larger proportion of semi-natural non-crop cover at the landscape scale would enhance mirit colonization by promoting the spillover to tomato crops early in spring. So how we achieved that, um, to do that, 
we selected 12 greenhouses managed by the same plant protection advisor that was Monse Matas, a co-author in this work. And it's 12 because it's the 12 greenhouses that were managed by her during five years. And uh, with these 12 greenhouses, we did a greenhouse characterization. We uh, checked uh, the structure, how are their openings, if the transplant took place early, mid or late in the season, uh, crop diversity, if there was tomato or more crops inside, and which, uh, if there was one or more tomato varieties, and also like at the altitude this greenhouse was because in the Maresme region that's close to Barcelona, we have the seaside and we have mountains just next to it. So the altitude can differ quite a lot between one and the other greenhouses. And of course, greenhouse area. So what we did in these greenhouses, uh, we did two things. One is we um, placed sticky trap, uh, yellow sticky traps in uh, during five times during the sampling during the whole season. And also we did bit sampling of these predators in bunker plants in the five greenhouses that had bunker plants. Here I show next to each greenhouse I did, there's a small flower and it means these greenhouses had some calendula plants in them. And then what we did is like we used the uh, Monse Matas records of the past five years and then we extra extracted historical data of when was the first meet uh, observed, which was the species of the merit, when was the transplant date. And uh, we also extracted some weather data and we did some farmer interview to be able to answer the question about uh, if there really existed early versus late colonization greenhouses. From all this, we obtained um, the precocity of the Macrolophus pygmaeus, precocity in terms of if it was recover one individual in the first sampling, in the second sampling, in the third. If one individual would be recovered only in the third sampling, then I would consider its precocity was three, meaning precocity of one is like a really uh, early arrival of the predator of the predator to the greenhouse. And then we also record the test and then we um, we did some indexes at two time points to evaluate pest pressure. And of course, we consider, as I mentioned, the calendula bunker plant presence. Now, and then at the farm scale, what we did is um, we sampled, what we ID plant species that were at the, at the perimeter of each greenhouse. We evaluated how many sampling points there were in 10 meters interval, and then we sample uh, the plants in a, a half a meter per half a meter sampling unit. And also once plants were identified and covered, and the cover was written up, we did also um, bit sampling and we collected the immediate individuals by sucking them. And then we obtained uh, several variables, among them the cemetery of millet per greenhouse, host plant richness, and host plant occupancy, etc. And um, sorry, these uh, millets that we collected, we took them back to the lab and uh, we reared them till adulthood so we could classify them into species. However, what I didn't mention before is that Macrolophus species, um, they can be uh, confused between two species. It's a cryptic species. So there's Macrolophus pygmaeus and melanotoma. And Macrolophus melanotoma is not a natural enemy of tomato. So we needed to know really that what we were sampling were the, those Macrolophus that would do uh, would become predators in tomato greenhouses. So what we did is uh, uh, Nuria Agusti um, um, did well, did uh, design some primers, improve some primers, and then we were able to to by uh, by barcoding to to distinguish between the two species. Otherwise, you need to do the morphometrics, and it's a lot of work. And so finally, we could identify, and we could relate which host plants, which were host plants for each species. 
And also then we evaluated at the landscape, uh, the landscape scale and we extracted some predictors from uh, stick pack cover maps. We overlapped it with our um, with our greenhouses and in, a, in, radio, in radiuses of 150 and 250 meters. And we double check in terrain that whatever was assigned by SIGPAC was a correct classification. Um, the classification was mainly crop and non-crop and crop included protected horticulture, open field agriculture and olive and vineyard trees. And all that was not crop, uh, it was divided into urban and four semi-natural habitat cover classes, herbaceous, shrub, woodland, and riparian, and the sum of all of them as semi-natural. And now, yeah, we did an evaluation of these um, predictors, their correlations to be able to, to see which interpretations we could differ if one of these variables was select, selected in further models. Yeah, probably it's not really possible to to see what's written in there, but uh, I will refer to it if, if needed. And yeah, with these methods, then I will pass to results uh, to see how we, if we could answer our hypotheses and our questions. So first of all, uh, um, we saw clearly when we uh, check the historical data and in our samplings that the key predator was Macrolophus pygmaeus. It was the first to arrive and it was the one like in, in the higher abundances, like in all the years of the study. When we consider historical data and the five years of the study, we saw that greenhouse identity was a really uh, powerful predictor on uh, Macrolophus pygmaeus arrival. So there was some room to um, think that there were early colonizing greenhouses and late colonizing greenhouses because between the earliest and the latest, there was an up to two month difference in colonization. Um, also, we could see that um, warm springs and wet springs favored earlier colonization by these predators of the greenhouses. And surprisingly, there was no effect of planting date, even if it was quite distinct between greenhouses. Uh, as a good news, the main Nesidial Coris tenuis, which I remember they could cause uh, um, plant damage, was only observed in two greenhouses where it had been inoculated years earlier. Um, here there's a brief summary of what we found as for the identification of host plants for many predators. As you can see here, there's in this table, you can see the list of host plants, and then you can see Macrolophus species and Decifus polyvari. Well, it's one of the Decifus species, but I will not focus on that. What I will focus is that we try to do PCRs in all the plants where we could detect both adults and nymphs of the in the host plant. So we would be sure that it was a host plant once nymphs were detected there and not just a plant where an adult had landed. And most of, in most of the plants where we uh, captured Macrolophus pygmaeus, Macrolophus, it was indeed Macrolophus pygmaeus, with the exception of Ditrichia viscosa, that the, that the individuals uh, captured were um, Macrolophus melanotoma, but that, that time we took it a bit as a, as a positive control for Macrolophus melanotoma, as we already had uh, this information. So in total, uh, we identified eight host plants of Macrolophus pygmaeus that were indeed uh, next to the tomato greenhouses. And the good news was that five of them also hosted uh, Distipus bolivari, which means that conserving this species, it's not only uh, to target one species of predator, but can be a wider strategy. In this next table, I show you uh, the, first, um, the first bit of a table in which we quantify the mid populations at the farm scale by, well, what I mentioned about the beating of the vegetation and sucking. And here in, um, I show in orange that greenhouse one and two, um, they had a, a lot, a very elevated number of macrolophus, but those macrolophus were found 
in uh, Carlendula officinale plants that were planted outside the greenhouses. In green, however, I show those macrolophos found in other host plants. And as you can see, in it can be considering it was only two sampling dates and it was in spring, there can be a considerable amount of macrolophus and other medids in these in these host plants. And also what I want to point out is the distribution of the um, of these medids along the greenhouses. We can see that there's greenhouses where have a, a, a lot of captures of medids, while there's some like on the right hand side that they have none. The same can be said for host plants. Um, I want to focus on greenhouse number three, where we have a big number of captures of macrolophus and other meats, but also we have the, um, the highest richness in host plants of all the greenhouses. And in addition, the highest number of points with host plant presence from all the potential point samples. This means that wherever you went almost around the greenhouse, there was adjacent vegetation and this adjacent ve vegetation had host plants that would favor uh, these predators. On the other hand, if we check at the, at the red uh, bit on the right hand side, uh, there was almost no vegetation at all surrounding those greenhouses by either that had been eliminated by mechanical or chemical means which um, meant that these uh, surroundings of these greenhouses were much poorer in terms of natural enemies or for meat predators. And here, finally, I will present the, the results on, um, uh, on um, with it a linear model with all the different predictors and, and interactions of the lands, landscape and farm scale and greenhouse uh, variables as our end was quite reduced, it was only 12 greenhouses, we had to follow um, a careful approach in order to do that. And our decision was to first focus on landscape variables. And once they were selected, then just to cross them one to one, all possible combinations with farm scale and greenhouse um, greenhouse variables. And then what we did is uh, we did model selection based on uh, AICC values. So here I present the uh, best models, the best and uh, only models, there were no competing models uh, close in AAC values. And we can see here in this table that the main um, selected variables were PS250, that doesn't mean a lot, but it's the herbaceous semi-natural cover at uh, 250 meters buffer and uh, calendula bunker plants and its interaction. While for uh, abundance of macrolophus pygmaeus, the best predictor was the precocity of this, uh, of this uh, predator. N the variables on, on prey abundance and farm scale medit abundance and greenhouse variables were not selected in these models. Here I show better in a graph the results from the colonial, colonial, colonization precocity of macrolophus pygmaeus. And we can see like in the black line is those greenhouses that they did not have calendula plants inside. And the orange line is those greenhouses that had a calendula, calendula bunker plant inside. And what we can see is that bunker plants encourage early colonization in those greenhouses associated to small amounts of herbaceous semi-natural habitats, which corresponds to the left of the graph. Uh, so um, landscape uh, semi-natural habitat was really, um, really affecting the colonization precocity of these predators, but only when uh, bunker plants were not there. So there's a clear effect of the landscape, but this effect is attenuated or when bunker plants are there as they foster early colonization. So the perspective of this work, the conclusions, were that colonization precocity of a particular greenhouse was consistent across years, 
and that warm and wet springs favor the colonization. The analysis showed no effects of the greenhouse variables and colonization precocity in contrast with other studies that detected strong effects of greenhouse management. For example, the study of Abidon in 2016 that they showed that it was really different the manage of organic agriculture and conventional one. This suggests that the greenhouses in the current study had relatively homogeneous crop practices. And it was probably due to, sorry, something got in my screen. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> and it was uh, probably due that everything was managed by a unique plant protection advisor. And uh, then uh, calendula bunker plants are a key low cost tool to foster biological control in tomato. And its use can compensate killing houses with poor natural colonization by predators, by milk predators. And the tomato colonization by these predators from calendula bunker plants can reach similar levels as inoculation biological control. There's a couple of references that show that. And, but um, according to, um, to the uh, literature and our other experiments with it in the field, these bunker plants should be placed in numerous patches and so they would enhance immediate spatial distribution in the crop. At the moment they are mainly in one of the sites or several sites of the greenhouse but that um, makes it more difficult the evenness in the crop. Um, yet it's important that we keep surveying calendula plants because we need to mod monitor for Nesidiot coristenius populations and avoid plant damage. And finally, uh, what I really want to, um, to speak about is that bunker plants, though, should not substitute the insurance habitats at farm scale and landscape scale. And that ideally we can target conservation of different natural enemy groups by planning uh, biodiversity rich horticultural farms. In these habitats, we have a uh, unique, they have unique conservation value and it's not about one pest and it's not about one natural enemy and um, several research lines in a lot of country are proving that this is possible and, and thank you.